so tonight, uh, tonight our theme is the impact of virtual communities on flame working. And our agenda, uh, we have several prompts tonight and here's just some, uh, some food for thought. How can we define technology? How does technology help you connect with the community? What platforms do you use and for what? In what ways can technology be used to address accessibility and equity? How has social media accelerated the field of flame working? Do you think virtual platforms have the potential to democratize flame working? So we're looking forward to hearing your responses to some of those prompts. But first, we just wanted to do a quick uh, geeks check-in um, as we wrap up the end of our season here. Um, and I'm just curious to see, uh, has the space served you well? Um, Geeks has hosted four Flame Affinity meetings this year. Does four meetings a year feel pretty good to you guys? Or would you think three meetings would feel substantial? So for example, one in the fall, one in the spring, and one in the summer. Um, have you made use of any of the recordings in the meeting notes? And do you have any suggestions for continuing to grow this audience and who participates, as well as thoughts uh, regarding sustainability and support? Um, we would love to hear any of your feedback and then also suggestions that you might have about how we might kind of continue towards the next season or towards the future or build additional programming. Um, so I think we're going to revisit these questions at the end, but if anybody has any thoughts in the meantime, um, go ahead and pop them in the chat um, so that you know they're there for us to reference. That'd be, that'd be really awesome. We'd love to hear from you all. All right. We will follow up with a consolidated and edited notes from this meeting and share it to the Flame Chat group, which you'll be added to if you've joined tonight's discussion. Uh, and as a reminder, throw some support towards Geeks if you're able. We really appreciate it. All right. So we're on to tonight's programming here. Um, and our topic is uh, the impact of virtual communities in the field of flame working. So where we'd like to start tonight is um, with the question, what virtual platforms do you use to connect with the flame working community? And I think it would be great to hear from both newcomers to the community and folks who have seen technological change. Also, I know that there are a few of you who join us from kind of uh, geographically remote locations. So, you know, obviously everybody kind of has a different perspective here and we're all using uh, technology to connect to this virtual community. So uh, we'd love to hear uh, some of your experiences. Um, and I would like, I'll go first here. I would like, I'm going to just drop uh, some notes in the chat real quick. Um, here we go. Chatting. Okay. So I'm just gonna copy. Okay, so it's a little list that I made recently that I wanted to share with you all. Um, I was reflecting on my 25 years in the flame working community as a practitioner and also um, as uh, an educator. And just thinking about how far we've come since I first started to learn how to flame work. And so, you know, in the 90s, it was books, magazines, uh, groups like the, you know, the International Society of Glass Bead Makers. We ordered supplies through mail order, remember that? And then, you know, into the 2000s, there were some early online forums like glassbeads.org, glasspipes.org, or wet canvas, lamp working, et cetera, where we could kind of start to gather online. That was my experience, at least, connect people from different geographic locations. And then the development of Etsy and eBay further kind of grew the online community and the functionality there. In the 2000s, we saw the rise of social media with Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, more ways to connect. And then we saw the rise of kind of like the, the pipe making scene coming up and that really took place on Instagram and kind of blew up on social media. And then finally in the 2020s, now we're in the age of Zoom and live streams and we have online conferences and lots of ways to connect online. Um, so those are just some of the ways that I've experienced technology through um, through my career, um, down to right now facilitating this this space here, um, the geeks uh, the geeks affinity group um, on this virtual platform. 
So I would say the virtual community is really important to me and has helped me connect with a, a larger group of people. And for us all to gather in this space together where I don't know that all of us have ever been in one space together. Um, not a time that I can remember at least. So um, I think the virtual space allows us all to gather in a way that um, would maybe not be very practical in the physical world. So I'd love to hear from some of you now. Um, so uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to, there's a couple ways to participate. Please work the chat and we'll try to weave um, comments from the chat back into the discussion. And then also, if you'd like to address the group, please use the hand raise function and then I will facilitate. Oh, let me also introduce my co-facilitator. I'm so sorry. Madeline Ryle Smith will be our co-facilitator tonight. Um, and so I will I'll start and then we'll switch halfway and Madeline will facilitate the second half of the meeting tonight. Um, and we also have two members of Geeks here tonight. I'm going to call you out. Helen Leach <laughs> and Ben Orozco, um, our awesome Geeks crew. So thank you so much. Glad you could be with us tonight. Okay. So yeah, does anybody have anything to, um, to add? How do you, um, how do you connect with other flame workers through, um, through virtual space? Madeline. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, you know, this conversation we were having was so funny about, um, you know, kind of the history of social media and information um, and kind of how uh, drastically it's changed in the past like 20 years or so. So like when I came on um, lamp working, I, I think my primary mode of social media was wet canvas and la lamp work, et cetera, dot com. And that was like, I was in high school and I was like, didn't know any other lamp workers. And so all of my community were just sort of like faceless, nameless people, like on a orange forum. Um, and everyone had like pseudonyms. So I could have known half the people talking on that forum, but like everyone had a different name than they actually had today. Cause it was kind of before it was like um, less anonymous. And all of my information was there in the form of like tutorials that were posted in a blog post. And I would, scourglasspipes.org, glassbeads.org for inspiration because you really had to seek it out. And YouTube had some really random demos on there. It was like just people kind of figuring stuff out in their basement. Um, and it was like any amount of information was like so precious, like compared to now where it's like an information overload, any amount of like communication and, and data was, it was, it's so interesting to compare the two. Um, and I think right now I use Instagram obviously a lot and, um, kind of as a tool, a research tool, um, a sort of, a, a relaxation research kind of like passive and active at the same time. Um, and I like that it's so raw that you can like connect with artists and see the artwork they're doing right now in progress, like, and often a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Whereas if you go on like an artist's website or something, it's a lot more curated and a lot less organic. Um, so I really, I love that. Um, kind of that idea of behind the scenes and the, the instantaneousness of, um, of Instagram. Um, yeah, those are my main ones. I'll let someone else go if you want. Right on. Yeah, it's it's almost like the lag time has shortened, right? Between when content's created and when you can consume it. You don't have to like wait for it to arrive in a magazine anymore. I can't believe we did yeah. that. Looking back, you know, <laughs> oh it's crazy. But, yeah. All right. Uh, would anybody else like to share their uh, experience about how, how they use technology besides geeks, of course, or including geeks? Um, <laughs> ways that... Uh, you, you connect with the flame working community through virtual space. Helen. Well, I'm not directly answering your question, but I just in listening to you and Madeline talk, I'm making the observation that um, it's like now when you're learning, you can be so selective what you choose to learn. But back in the day, it was just sort of like, you get what you get and like, that's everything there is for you, you know? And so it's just a really different pathway to, in terms of being empowered to sort of like choose what path you want to take. 
Yeah, exactly. That's what I was, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Cause it's like, now there's so much information. You could look up a YouTube high quality video of like, you know, any kind of technique you want. And it's really empowering. Like you said, um, there's so much room for autodidacts to really like hone their skills and just take off without having to go anywhere. And then at the same time, I kind of think there might be this flip side where it's like, I almost get like a sense of information overload where I'll have like a Google Chrome browser with like a million tabs of like different like discussions or demos or techniques open. And I'm like, oh my God, like I don't even know what to pay attention to right now, what to focus on. Um, And it almost, yeah, it feels like there's so much rich, like readily available, wonderful information out there. Um, and it, it changed at least the way I kind of like, um, I approach it at least. And I feel like with flame working too, there's so many like high quality videos, um, on YouTube and stuff like that. So I think it's, you know, I'm just spoiled now. I wonder, I wonder if anyone else kind of like has the same, um, feeling if you're like going and approaching, like trying to learn a technique or something, if you, it's, you love how easy it is, if you find it's easy to, um, to access information or if it is almost like, um, like this illusion of having to like choice, too much choice to choose from. You know, to piggyback on that, I kind of feel like with all of this, you know, data that's available now, um, as a, as a consumer of that data, I find that I have to vet it, you know, and I'm responsible for deciding um, what, you know, what to consume, but also like what's good info and what's not good info, you know, um, and how do I, how do I rate that? Um, so that's kind of like a new problem to have where before it was just like, I'll take anything, you know? So yeah. Um, then. Yeah. So for me, it was definitely in the context of the neon and plasma when it comes to learning my flame working techniques. And so I was using Instagram when I started learning neon in 2016. And I would say for me, it was more so the cherry on top of how I was getting information. Like, I think I was still getting a lot of my information of like doing the the basics of everything and the fundamentals in person. But then there would be these little slight tricks that people would do that you wouldn't really pick up on if you didn't know the foundation. And that's how I learned a lot of really great techniques for getting better accuracy and how I was making pieces was watching sign shops and how they were bending or how they were setting up paper patterns for things. And I would say now a lot of what I do is very much peer to peer where usually I know somebody with a very specific question for a very specific scenario that I need to do. So it's a little bit more like direct with people, but Definitely in the beginning and now I still pick up little tricks in random spurts on social networks. Right on. Um, Joe has uh, an interesting point here. He says the fascinating thing about the abundance of information is that we've become dependent on things like algorithms to curate the flood of content, which is a double edged sword due to the biases that algorithms have as well as the lack of transparency in the algorithms. That's a great point, Joe. And I think of YouTube, especially, you know, I start off watching flame working videos and then pretty quickly it kind of spirals into some other topic. Um, So yeah, that's that's definitely a new issue as well. All right. All right. So, you know, it would be great to hear. Oh, Sam. All right, Sam. Hi. Hey, can you all hear me over my torch? Yeah. Cool. Um, Yeah, I guess I'll just share my kind of experience with the social media. Uh, It was really prevalent when I started blowing glass. I feel like I started blowing glass and the next day Instagram came out. Um, And I was against social media. And I thought it was just this excess thing. I already had a phone. Why do I need this thing? So I didn't get one for a while. And I had a older glass blower or more uh, veteran glass blower tell me, "Hey, how are they going to find you if you don't have some?" If
All right, we lost Sam, but she'll she'll come back in. <laughs> but yeah, talking about you know the um, the importance of having an Instagram presence um, uh, as as having value um, in, in a way to be seen in the community too. Uh, it'd be interesting to get like somebody coming from the pipe scene um, opinion on that too, because I know Instagram was one of the platforms that was like really heavily um, used. Lydia, hi. Lydia, you're muted. You're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Yes, there we go. Hello, I'm Lydia. I make pipes in Los Angeles. Um, I learned in Eugene. Um, so starting from just like learning in like the pipe scene, you saw like I started off seeing everybody like first reacting to Instagram and like, you know, learning how to interact with social media. And I found it a really interesting tool that because if you don't necessarily want to be around a lot of people, but you still want to keep up on what everybody's doing this competition on Instagram to who can make the, you know, most what in whatever style you get to see all that happening in real time. And you get to see um, people's technology develop. Um, and with the amount of coverage people are giving of themselves, you know, you can see how something can be made. And also with people going on like live, cause like, you know, Instagram forces you to inst interact and like make content for them. Right. So you get a lot of people trying to boost their, um, what is it? It's not interaction, but it's some other word that's like that um trying to boost that so that they get like a better place in the algorithm you see things like um people going live while they're blowing glass uh boston distillery is a good example of that um he has a scientific shop in boston has been doing it for a while and every thursday he like takes questions on his story and then we'll pick a few and then answer them and like you know talk about tools talk about technique show you technique all this stuff super useful like all for free. So that has been like stuff like that has been a fantastic resource. Like, as, you know, like you were saying earlier, when people are remote, technology helps with that. Like if you don't necessarily want to go to the glass show and get COVID from the Wooks, then you can still like keep up with what is happening in the community, you know, without risking getting sick. Uh, and also another thing that's been really helpful is because of like the quality of technology of video chat like this and specifically in Instagram, um, a lot of people that I know and I've made friends with over Instagram, I may, we're able to talk about technique and stuff like in real time. Like I can video chat someone and be all like, yo, why is this color burning out? Like, yo, why is this cracked? What do you think? And then, you know, we give each other feedback in real time, which I, is great for like creating community and stuff, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's like live tech support, but peer to peer support. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah great point. Um, yeah, and Boston Distillery, if, if you all don't follow him, um, he's, he does his live streams are, are really informative and he takes requests. So um, put that on your list of things to check out for sure. All right. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to share their perspective on um, engaging in virtual communities? Madeline. Well, it's kind of a question that we were thinking about and I think is really fascinating, which is like, um, what platforms do you, do you, are there specific platforms that you'll go to for specific things? Like for instance, I'll go to Instagram for inspiration I'll go to like TikTok if I want to veg out um, I or like post something and get lots of visibility. I will go to Facebook groups if I want specific information because the, these Facebook groups are very easily searchable. Um, but at the same time, like with, the, with Facebook, I often um, will be a lurker because there's a lot of like um, a lot of like really experienced um, very knowledgeable people on Facebook in these groups. And then there's also like a lot of random people um, who maybe aren't that like, <laughs> have a lot of like experience socializing with other people. Um, and so I like, it's, I think it's interesting because for me, I approach each platform in such a different way. Like I'm always like, I'm, if I post on like, you know, a uh, torch talk or a Facebook group, I'm like holding my breath the whole time. But then like, I've gotten so much amazing information, things that like, you know, wouldn't have occurred to me um, just because it, there's just so many people out there and they're using, they're using that platform. 
Um, so I, I sort of like have a different relationship with every different um, platform. And yeah, I was wondering if anyone else had any thoughts about that or had like felt the same way. Yeah, I tend to use different platforms for different things as well. Um, I have them kind of linked together, but yeah, there's definitely a different crowd on the Facebook and, and, it, and, you know, in my experience, like kind of referencing that list I put in the chat for me, the Facebook groups are kind of like what the forums used to be like what canvas and lamp working, et cetera. And so I'll, I'll work the Facebook groups for, um, you know, if I want to post a question and, and get like a variety of different answers. And it also tends to be like, this is a generalization, some of like, um, some of the wizards and, and the really knowledgeable people tend to be on Facebook. Um, and so, you know, like Instagram tends to be like a little bit more of a younger crowd, like maybe like contemporary practitioners, like, you know, peers and stuff. And so I go to the different platforms to get a different audience. Yeah. <clears throat> Does anybody use Discord here? Um, just kind of curious. Paul. Uh, I was going to say um, <clears throat> Discord, I don't specifically use it too much, but I used it uh, when I took a class with Scotty Mickel online. It was like a, a mix between Twitch and Discord. Um, and it's just kind of interesting how there's not like one platform that kind of supports everything yet. It's always like a mix in between things. Um, but it's like an interesting, it worked really well, um, for that experience that I had. I don't personally use it, but it's something that I would like, uh, like to do in the future. And was that a, like a virtual class situation or like a hybrid or? Yeah. So it was like a one day class where it was like, he had two, two cameras set up in his studio and then like mm -hmm. uh, teaching a group of, of students. Great. Yeah, it was really sweet to be able to like see the bench, but then also have your own workspace and like talk with the instructor and be comfortable in your space. And I think that's something that flame working has that like hot shop or cold working or a lot of other studios. They just don't. Yeah, I don't know work, work in the same way. So I found that really interesting. Yeah, we have we have somebody flame working from their studio right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a, um, that's pretty interesting. And then, you know, this whole idea, I think of having, um, having uh, online workshops be interactive and not just like a presentation is something that feels relatively new as well. Um, at least in my, in my opinion, or in my experience. All right, Janine. Hello. Hi, hi everybody. So I um, have been a pretty um, staunch Luddite for a long time. I only got a smartphone like two months ago. Um, but some things, I, I have a tablet. Um, anyway, two things that I really enjoyed during COVID that I would not have done otherwise. I was asked to give a demo for the ISGB and I was able to do that online and reach all of these people who most of whom didn't know me yet, some of whom told me they had met me before. That was really um, heartwarming, especially because it was when we were super isolated and everything was closed and everyone felt so far away. And then the other thing that I did was I took um, a history of flame working class through Corning online with Eric Goldschmidt and um, is it Beth Hyam? Is that who it was? And, and that was just fantastic and it made me feel um, really, really great because where I live, I feel like I don't know a lot of other lamp workers. And so to be able to connect in this way and in those ways was really meaningful for me. Um, and I'm very thankful that that happened during COVID. I probably wouldn't have done it otherwise. Yeah, same regarding the, the COVID stuff too. And then I also think about like, like when I first started, I lived in Chicago, there weren't a lot of other um flame workers there wasn't really a community even in a city like chicago and so i just think like oh what if we had this technology then you know 
um, it would have been so nice to find community, but I mean, I guess then I wouldn't have been as motivated to make community. Maybe, I don't know, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's so amazing if you're geographically isolated to be able to connect in a meaningful way now, um, through virtual space. And so many of us as flame workers are, we do tend to be pretty spread out because we, we can work out of our garages or out of a, you know, pretty much anywhere. Our equipment's portable. A lot of us travel around. So it kind of suits the community that we're able to, to find a community here in virtual space. It all sort of makes sense. All right, does anybody have um, any other uh, experiences that they'd like to share um, as far as uh, what, you, what virtual platforms you use to connect with the, um, with the flame working community? Are there any other angles that you can think of that we can kind of like examine this from? We good? All right. Um, so let's continue on to our next prompt, which is um, in what ways can technology be used to address accessibility and equity? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Does technology, uh, you know, virtual communities make it easier, more accessible to access information? Or do we still have the same kind of gatekeeping? Do you experience gatekeeping um, online as you would in other institutions? We've talked about some of these um, access barriers before in the flame working world. And I'm just kind of wondering what your experiences are um, online versus uh, accessing institutions physically, um, if you know how your experiences compare, and if anybody can speak to that. <clears throat> and while we are uh, kind of discussing this, I know I posted a couple of um, questions early this week, and uh, I'm going to post the um, the comments here. Somebody answered the question in my Facebook. Oh, Mose, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Hi. Hey, hold on a second. Uh, Where are you going? Okay. Off, and there's a fan, <laughs> like, kind of, it was in my face. Okay. So, can you repeat the question? Because I think I can answer. Yeah. Okay. In what ways can technology be used to address accessibility and equity? Okay. Um, I got, like, two examples. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, because of the George Floyd situation. Um, you know, a lot of, um, especially around here, um, other places like Corning, um, you know, I think they have a, a BIPOC grant now. Um, and I recently, a uh, perfect example, like it was, was it Shelby or was it Mike? I think it was Mike um, sent me the link for the, the, the application because I kind of like have been off the radar for a lot of things, just kind of on my own role in California here in, um, in the Bay. Um, but he sent me the thing. And I was, you know, was like right on Instagram. I got it. I looked at it. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, this is really interesting. They got like a thing for, you know, people of color um, to apply for a grant in a situation like that. And I would have probably never, you know, gone to just check Corning's website or any of the social media because that's just not my, like my realm these days. Um, and then another perfect example is uh, for like, you know, just equality situation. Like, I don't really, you know, like I post stuff, but like, I don't really feel I get a lot of value um, for my sake. You know, like there's not too many, um, like at least on Instagram, Facebook, you might get feedback, but you know, what's a comment, right? When you're trying to pay bills. Um, so for me, I recently uh, did the, the LinkedIn thing and that works for me because in the professional world, you know, like that's kind of where, where I'm at with the career thing. But I recently like um, had a, a show last month and I have a lot of people of color, um, like professionals, like lawyers, you know, directors, people who like, you know, pretty much got to who can buy expensive art um, was my, my whole point. And um, I, I wrote a story about one of the pieces that I, I was doing. And, you know, like I said, I have this network where it's mostly just like colleagues and in different type of people, people I want to get to know and like learn how they how they built their careers and things like that. And um, a black woman totally bought one of my like higher end pieces, you know, where like, you know, all the rest people like just commented or this and that, but she totally was like, 
Um, I'm interested in your police, blah, 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 blah. We've had a conversation and I shipped it out last week, but that has never happened like that. You know, I've been on, you know, Instagram, Facebook since like, you know, 2012, 2010, you know, and I kind of like specifically um, target LinkedIn to just like black professionals who are making money, who are in the world, making change, making shit happen. Um, and I totally got what I was looking for. You know, like almost first week that, you know, the picture went up, whatnot. She kind of waited for the show to end, which is great because I didn't have to cut a split with the gallery. So it was like perfect. But that was kind of a thing where I used like technology to like specifically like target my audience who I was looking for and and, and write like a, a actual story um, where I feel like people actually read it. You know, like we all know Instagram just like, you know, it's just like flipping through. You might stop. You might hit the heart and you move on tick you know tiktok almost the same if it doesn't interest you but i don't know if you guys are on linkedin like that but like you know there's really great articles of you know like like i said people in my profession whether it's innovation in stem or you know some really cool startups happening amongst my area um and just around the world and i i read a lot of the articles of you know innovations coming out and things like that and i totally just like wrote this whole like meaningful why I did this piece the connection I had all the things and it got a lot of good feedback the views the comments were all like I could tell people really like resonated with and read it and then you know she cut a check so it was like really great that you know like we have so many different forms like um I forgot who was who had just mentioned it um Madeline just mentioned, you know, like they all kind of serve a different purpose. And I'm glad there's one out there where I feel like, you know, it's, it's a little more in my, in my, for me, a little more professional and targeted towards um, the people I'm trying to reach. Well, that's great that, that, um, that work, that it resulted in a sale. And uh, I'm glad you're able to find a platform that kind of you're able to work like that and, and turn it into something, you know, that that benefits you in the real world. Um, if, guys, I mean, uh, if, if you guys aren't aware, LinkedIn is a lot of B2B. So business to business mm -hmm. uh, is where, uh, you know, it's, its main thing is B2B. So I don't know if, 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 for, if, it's, if it's new for a lot of you guys out there. Um, it's really mm -hmm. good kind of dress up the whole resume and website and all the things and references and recommendations and all that stuff. And, um, you know, like it's, it's, it's a really great platform just as far as like, even outside of the art world, um, job, the reason I'm out here is because I looked on LinkedIn when I was in Salem and I got a job in LA and then I was able to leave LA to move to Silicon Valley for a tech job all on so it's just, it's just, you know, like, I think it works where, you know, it's not the algorithm isn't going towards the likes or how many followers this person has, but it's kind of just like a little more, I think, um, equal. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mose. Um, Jolie has a comment here that is kind of related in a way. He says, um, I'm kind of uneasy at how centralized all the platforms are. There's a lot of influence on the entities that run the platforms having uh, have in affecting the communities. And it's often done without any awareness for smaller communities like the flame working community. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and he finds that, he said, I find that I use platforms out of necessity because so many people are relying on them as primary source, but I'm uh, uneasy, I'm anxious, I'm uneasy to be so dependent on a platform or company that views me more of a product than a customer. Um, you know, I feel that on Instagram, I think a lot with kind of like Lydia mentioned before, like kind of playing to the algorithm or like having some sort of engagement and you get kind of rewarded for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Is anybody else um, able to, to speak to, to any of that? Um, do you feel like you're able to um, to uh, access uh, a community of like access your community online or um, or some of these like algorithms getting in the way? Um,
All right, let's see. Let's look at what's going on in the chat here. Cool. Again, that's why this space is very special and unique. This is a very special and unique space for sure that we've created here in Geeks. Um, yeah, I think that um, the thing about Geeks is that we're able to kind of like, um, we're able to use this as a meeting space and the algorithms are not affecting our content here. Um, so that's what's, that's what's nice about this platform. Um, <clears throat> some of the other platforms I know, oh, Madeline, Go ahead. Yeah, I was just like sort of tagging on to that, um, which is like, that's what I'm always thinking. It's like, I love being able to use these platforms in the social media. I know like Mark Zuckerberg, like, you know, owns like Instagram and he's like, you know, evil and all this stuff. And there are these forces and I, and I'm so dependent on social media um, as like part of my practice. And, you know, it's just, it's a big part of what I do. And I, I kind of think I might have the same kind of uneasiness that Joe maybe is talking about where it's like, you know, it, it's free to use all of these platforms and they're amazing, but it's like, well, what's really being sold here? <laughs> is it, um, or is it our attention? Is it um, our clicks? Is it our data? Um, and, you know, I kind of like, it, I, there's like some cognitive dissonance there where I'm like, oh yeah, like they're probably stealing all my information, but I'm dependent on social media now. I don't know if I could, um, it would be difficult for me to start over and not use this platform just because of all the time I've invested in it already. Um, and so I guess maybe that's sort of like the, the double edge to the sword here mm -hmm. that I see. Hmm. David, David Willis, hello. Hi. Um, you know, that, that, uh, what you just said, Madeline, is really interesting to me because I've heard, you know, in other kind of um, organizations these days, you know, marketing is really. I, marketing's always a thing if you're trying to sell something as a professional I'm not saying this is new but you know the way that people market using these platforms is is pretty new and it's and it's really big you get a lot of contact so you know I was having this conversation with a friend who's a glass person and you know a generation older than I am I'm 54 he's 70 something so maybe two generations and you know the question of what is the role you know could could the things that we're talking about you know could your career exist without social media could you know the the institutions that are serving our community that you know many of them have been around for decades could they exist without social media in today's market and that's, you know, kind of a dialogue he and I were having, and I think is an interesting question. You know, my business doesn't rely on social media, although I enjoy it and I find it an effective way to communicate with my friends and see what they're doing. But I don't think, probably because the age of the people I'm working with too, and the fact that I'm not doing business, you know, I could exist without it, but it obviously has an important role but how big is that role is a, is a question that, you know, I've conversation I've been having that I think is interesting. That's all I got. Thank you, Sir Frat. Hello. You're muted. Oh, now I'm off. Yeah, okay. You're good. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of, when the pandemic hit, I really decided to make a shift from selling to shops to selling off my own website. And social media has been a big part of that and really jumping in and recognizing that as opposed to my pieces being seen in a shop or a gallery, they are now seen online. And so really trying to represent myself as good as I, as well as I can online and in my videos and to captivate an audience there and kind of now becoming more uh, in the creator space and getting paid to make those videos. It's interesting to see that if you get enough views, you're now the product to someone else because if you're attracting enough views, they want to pay you to keep making those videos of your glass. 
What kind of, how many views do you think that took for you to start getting that kind of attention just out of curiosity? Um, I don't know. Uh, I went from like in the 20,000 follower range to like 30 or 40 when I started getting the emails from Instagram saying they wanted to start me as, and you know, I, I set myself up as a creator. Uh, and I think you can do it as a creator or a business to start getting monetization status. And it's kind of slow to roll that on. It actually happens first with live and I don't really do live videos very much. I prefer to just make videos and not have to be performing live. I'd prefer to just perform and make a nice video of a product that I want to sell or a piece that I've been making. So I think probably uh, in the 20 to 30,000 follower range, and uh, one thing that I want to add to that is what's really helped me boost my thing is a combination of TikTok and Instagram, because if something goes viral on TikTok, which is almost synthetically viral, I think, uh, it pushes people to your Instagram. That's it. All right, uh, Madeline. And also, D Janine and David, um, you have your hands raised, so if you want to speak, leave it up. But if you don't, can you just turn it off so I can see what's what? Thank you. And Madeline, go ahead. Um, I think that's an interesting point uh, that uh, Surfrat made um, about, like, you do become the product after a little while. Like, people are like, you should start selling merch. And I was like, that's not even glass art. But it's like, you're like... <laughs> you're like the object you want to buy it's so it's so weird and funny um and then the thing about like tiktok versus instagram it's like interesting because for me like i i have my videos on tiktok have such a wider reach but i also don't like know anyone on tiktok like i know like four people which is kind of nice um and so i always like put things on tiktok first and kind of like play the waters and see how they do and then if it's if it does okay then i'll put it on instagram i'll be like that's where every, that's where my real community is. That's where everyone I know is. So um, it's much less anonymous in a sense, even though a video could like, you know, have a wide reach, um, but it's people I care about seeing. Um, and yeah, that was kind of something that just made me laugh a little bit. Yeah, I've noticed that, you know, I don't have a huge Instagram following. It's, it's, uh, it's curated but in specific to my audience but i have noticed that the the things that tend to get a lot of attention are like any post or story with my face in it or my body in it and those just go you know to a whole different audience who then want to engage with me so i guess that's instagram trying to sell me rather than my product i think it gets confused when it sees the product on my body and kind of goes with that um but another thing I do want to add is like, you know, I'm, I'm teaching a class here this week and, you know, we were kind of had the first day today and it was like the getting to know you phase. And a lot of the people in the class know me from my social media, which um, this is a new thing for me that's happened just since the pandemic. So that was exciting. And it, and it brought a totally different audience to my, you know, my teaching now, um, some really good glass blowers. So that's exciting. Um, so now that I know that I would maybe use social media a little more for that um that's all i wanted to say surf rat yes uh just to add to that uh not only having your face in your videos probably increases your reach which i don't know i haven't really done that in a while i was doing some interviews for a bit and i was trying to do long form interviews and that actually didn't do well at all like the longer videos on instagram for me i was doing interviews with other glass artists and they were getting a reach of like two to three hundred people which was crazy but when I started doing my videos much more well curated and when I started adding food or confusion, those were my two huge attractors. So adding some food, coffee, honestly, has been my biggest one or ice cream. <laughs> and, you know, people like those. And some confusion as far as size, dimension, what things were for has been huge for me. And I'm sure it could be good for other glass artists out there as well. That's it. What can I just ask you to clarify a little bit more what you mean by confusion? Like, do you just mean like dimen dimensional 
or like people don't know what what scale your work is or like ambiguous kind of or uh or... definitely dimensional people not knowing what scale um if you check out my account you'll see that i'm i'm making uh pieces that look like other pieces but they're at a different scale and so it's confusing and then i'm adding food to it too and so it's even more confusing cool um i know that it looks like you're in a car so can uh if uh you able to tell us what your instagram is so we can check it out uh surfratglass.com surf or surf rat at surfratglass or on my website surfratglass.com great but, awesome thank you thank you all right so let's hear from ben and then i'm gonna switch it over to madeline I had a follow-up question, and I feel like this is probably going to bleed into maybe one of our next topics, but I just wanted to hear, Madeline, since I am an active follower on your Instagram Reels, not on your TikTok, sadly, can you walk through the nuance and like how you approach your students since we're in the education space about featuring their products? And then also the fact that you have a pretty prominent audience. I mean, it's very cool that you platform who you're teaching. Like, that's a very great way to sort of move yourself away from being the only product. But that's always been something I'm curious about is like, how do you reach out to your students and say, hey, I really want to feature your cool product. Like you had one today that I love with the shadow and the flashlight. Yeah, it's such an interesting question. And I feel like it's a, you know, one of those brave new world kind of situations. So for me, at least like in the beginning of the semester, I'm usually like, guys, like this is part of my practice is like I film my like I, I make content, whatever. I'll probably be filming during our class. Does anyone have a problem with that? Just so I know right off the bat if anyone cares. And I haven't had any like no so far. And then like, usually when I'm walking around the studio, I'm like, I see someone doing something really cool. I like get like this spidey sense, like, oh, the internet's gonna love this. Um, I go up and I'm like, <laughs> hey, can I, can I take a picture? Can I film it? And usually they're like, yeah, that's great. Or like I establish a baseline with them. Like, okay, this person I know doesn't care. This person maybe doesn't want me to like show their face, but like they don't mind if I show their hands or show their piece. Um, so like, I kind of just try to take footage, like throughout the semester, like if I know, like right off the bat, the piece is going to be really amazing. I'll try to like video it as it's being made in different stages, <laughs> kind of like thinking ahead. Um, and then ultimately, um, if it's someone I've had that conversation with, I'll like be like, Hey, I'm going to post this, like, is this cool? Um, or if it's like a colleague who I film posting in this or, you know, I'm doing something in the studio and I'm like, I want to share that. I'll usually message them ahead of time. And just cause like with the rate, with the potential reach, I like really don't want to, you know, do anything that would, anyone would not be happy with. So I've taken, and I've also had a, like my work, um, kind of like taken and posted and not be credited enough times that I'm very sensitive to like, okay, if I, if I post someone's work, like you know, give their name, link to them if they have an account, um, link to the school, it's a good way to give the school visibility. Um, so I think that it's sort of like stages of checking in at various points. Um, but the experience I've had is that usually students are like really thrilled with it. Um, one really funny time was like, I saw this guy who I didn't really know before, but he was making something at Salem, looked really cool. It was like a scientific apparatus. And he was like, working all his homework and I was like oh like can I film this like do you mind if I make a video um and we had a nice little conversation it was a really great way to meet him and then like the next day I like I made this video um and I already got his permission he messaged me he's like my girlfriend was on TikTok scrolling on the for you page which is like the feed and my video came up on her feed just randomly and he was like that was the craziest like surreal experience I ever had <laughs> But he was like really excited and thrilled about it. So um, that kind of thing's just really wild and fun. <laughs> and the shopping cart guy, right? Who I think is here, Cameron, <laughs> who um, was my student at Salem and got what, like 23, 25 million views and um, wow. across the internet. And now he's famous as being the shopping cart guy. <laughs> Sorry, Cameron, if you don't, if you want to, you have to live up to something else now. <laughs> it is. Wow. It's so surreal. I mean, this is the landscape that we're living in now. Exactly. And, you know, also like I work at 
uh, one of the same schools Madeline does and um, everybody's using Instagram. And, you know, also we've talked about, like we have an ongoing dialogue with the students about the value of Instagram and of likes. And it's interesting to see here the students talk about like how they facilitate collaborations, for example. Um, one situation could be like one person has a lot of followers and one person has not so many. And so they cross pollinate to, you know, um, gain more followers. So I think what you're doing, Madeline, especially in this school is like right along the lines of what all the students are doing in their own entrepreneurship activities anyway. So it's leading by example in a way. Nice. And I'm going to pass it over to you now. So um, take it away. All Madeline. right. Cool, thank you. Um, and thanks everyone, it's great to see you all. I see that someone raised their, I think Paul, did you wanna add something before we go on? Yeah, I was just gonna say, cause like I'm, I'm at uh, VCU right now and there's, I mean, with the big push of like digital interaction and everybody's on their cell phones and uh, everybody's making content, it's also like how much of that is like a narcissistic distraction from actually being at the torch and like what is you know what is time at the torch and how do you integrate that and how do you how do you like the younger generation like i don't know approach that i think is a really interesting just thought and question and something to like kind of to consider um because some of the some of the times here the instructors are like no cell phones everyone put your cell phone away and that's like an older generation thing but like coming in as like new people teaching like this is a tool that everybody uses and so it's like how to demonstrate to do that um properly or in like a constructive manner i think is like a really good thing to consider absolutely i think that's a great point because like we all know social media can really be a distraction um and this idea of using social media responsibly um it's that's like you know because I, I see what we're talking about is like we're teaching students like it's almost a professional practice of sorts it's creating a presence creating an audience growing an audience creating content in a sense of um you know as a way to to bring people in to your practice and um, but I do think it's a fine line. Like, I think for some people, it can be a distraction or it can be like, oh, it looks so cool. Flame working. Let me like take a selfie at the torch. And like, um, when does that distraction <laughs> get too much? And, and maybe is it like, you know, right off the bat, like you're learning so much if you're a complete beginner first day on the torch. Like if you're trying to just take videos, like that could be not only distraction, but like dangerous. Whereas like maybe as you, you know, things become more second nature, you grow your experience, maybe it's, um, maybe then the line shifts. I'm not sure. It's a good question. Um, surf rat. Oh, you're muted. Did you want to say something? It was a big gap in my education. I have my bachelor's in fine art and they really never taught me how to market my work. And selling online wasn't as big of a thing then, but now it is such a big thing. And a lot of people go, you know, consumer direct to the manufacturer and now it's to the artist. And it can be a great way to actually turn somebody who wouldn't actually, you know, be successful and keep making art to somebody who is going to actually keep making art and uh, make money off of it. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I kind of had the same experience in school. Like we had a business practices class, but I learned how to write a resume and like make a business card, but I didn't learn too much about like marketing um, and kind of in that kind of thing, like, like growing an audience that way. And I think that it also for you was at a time where, um, you know, it was like right when Instagram was becoming a thing or maybe it hadn't become such a big thing yet. So I do think that the, this business practice or this these sort of professional practice lessons, like they're really changing by the year. Um, and it maybe it looks totally different now than it did like, you know, 10 years ago. Amy. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it looks <hi>. different. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've taught a, a like um 
a type of entrepreneurship for, for like over the course of the last 20 years in various formats. Um, and only like recently, I would say in the last like five or six years, have I started integrating like a social media into it. And I'm talking about like um, helping people start a small business that can help them support their art making. And then if they want to grow it into something that can support themselves full time, great, you know. But it's been really interesting to see um, how people find their audience online. And I live in New York City, so you would think you could be able to connect with an audience anywhere. But that's not true. And actually, online is so fruitful for, you know, my students to be able to connect with whoever they, you know, they want their audience to be. And a lot of times it's sort of like a, a niche market of like a very specific um, type of, of client um, that is not in the geographic location where they live, even though it's a huge city. So I thought that was like a really interesting observation um, and also kind of freeing for, you know, my students who are starting these businesses to be able to connect right away with folks who are um, feeling their product and who are supporting them financially. And surprising that it wasn't in the city, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That's huge. Being able to have a market and an audience that could be literally anywhere. Um, that's a like that's a huge part of I think social media. Um, and for people who sell things online. Great. So um kind of like that leads into our next question, which is how has social media accelerated the flame the field of flame working has social media accelerated the field of flame working has it you know decelerated it in any ways you know i think there's like good and bad to every sort of thing um and i guess i'll start while, uh, while you guys think of you know what you want to say um for me i think you know social media is like foremost a tool for visibility we can you know if you want to you know play into it you can create an audience and, and everyone can see it so i use social media to raise awareness of flame working usually to people who have no idea what glass is or what flame working is um so that's kind of my like mo is to be like look guys like this is flame working this is what it's capable of um often people have preconceived notions about what glass is, what it's capable of, what it can't do, how fragile it is. So I personally like to use social media to, um, to get it out there, especially I think my audience um, is often a non-glass audience or a beginner student audience. Um, but, you know, trying to think about what your audience is, I, I like it to be applicable to different kinds of audiences, but I think that's really what I'm thinking about. Um, and I like the internet because it allows me to see glass through fresh eyes. I think at this point in my life, I would be really dated, like, oh, wow, look at this really cool glass thing. Like, I, you know, see it all the time. But since I am often, like, seeing things through the lens of, oh, the internet's going to like this, like, oh, I'm going to, like, hit record and share this um, and curate it into a, a high-quality video, it's, um, it allows me to stay excited and stay, like, vigilant. Um, for the little things and, and allows me to see it through eyes other than my own. So that's a kind of a, a cool thing about it. Um, I'm just going to type the question into the chat. So yeah, if anyone has any other thoughts, feel free to chime in. And I think, you know, oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Surf Rat. Well, I think obviously uh, there's the whole pipe part of social media. And if that's, I mean, that's flame working. So yeah. we've got, I think that that's helped accelerate it because there's a lot of pipe makers sharing their torch work stuff online. And that audience tends to be, um, let's hope over 18, <laughs> over 21, but uh, they're younger. They're in that younger space where they are, they don't have as many bills and they're buying a lot of things. And so it has helped accelerate it because they're also on their phones a lot. Totally. That's a great point. And Amy and I were actually talking about that. Like, it feels like pipe making has like pushed the boundaries of what like social media, especially like Instagram can do, right? Like they have, it. that's like the home for the pipe making community. Um, and I think 
like one hypothesis is like, even though, you know, flame workers were all so isolated physically, their pipe making feels so strong because they use the internet as such a gathering place. Um, and they've really capitalized on that in, uh, in a way that's given a lot of visibility to them and um, a lot of like connection, which I think makes us stronger. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Anything I mean, else? I, I don't make pipes and I've kind of, first I switched to pendants and now I make more mugs, but it's still the same customer base because they've, they're educated on that and they're used to that price point and I haven't stepped into the architectural glass price point or whatever that is. And so uh, it's an interesting consumer base slash art uh, people that enjoy torchwork glass. Cool, thanks. Amy. You know, I, I have a lot of thoughts about um, the, you know, what we could call maybe success of the flame working, uh, visibility of the flame working community and the timeline of, you know, how technology has accelerated. And I, I'm not sure, you know, they seem very connected. Um, but, you know, I, I think of like uh, ways that people can share their work in the glass world in a more, more traditional sense, you know, precedents that have been set for forming community, uh, making like communities of, of glass makers. Um, and then, you know, we, we see what went on with the pipe making in the last like 10 years, say. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a community there that was formed outside of the traditional ways of making community in the glass world. And, um, and those artists all found a place and made a community using social media. Um, and then the physical gatherings, it seems like kind of followed almost. I don't know, I might be wrong on that, but it seems like the online community is really what brought everyone together to kind of actually form community that then um, kind of grew from there. Um, and so I, you know, I haven't really seen that happen too much in, in the glass world um, or as successfully in the glass world, except for just before the, the pipe making blew up, the glass bead community that I was a part of um, did start organizing online a little bit as it was, you know, as the technology was being developed. And I wonder what would have happened if the timeline had shifted, you know, if it's like the nature of the pipes or if it like, you know, the, um, or if it's the development of the social media or just, it was just kind of like a perfect storm that allowed those artists to band together and make a platform for themselves and form community. Um, but they, I mean, they're for sure tied together at this point, you know, um, but it's interesting to think about, and it sure was interesting to watch it all go down as well. That's super cool. And yeah, if any other pipe makers want to chime in and share their experience, we'd love to hear from you. David. Hi, <clears throat> I have a couple of comments. First, um, I think that there are glass blowers in the furnace who have done and are doing very well on social media. I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, it might be more from blown away than flame workers kind of on social media, but you know, I'm thinking of like Grant Garmazy, um, all of the blown away winners and, you know, other people have done really well. And I think that's great. <clears throat> but what I, what I was also thinking about in regards to the flame working pipe maker situation is I think it's interesting because um, it went, you know, at the very beginning of it, I started flame working with Bob Snodgrass in Eugene, Oregon in 1994. <clears throat> and that was the flame, that's, that's flame, that's where flame working was for the most part. And it was very in real life community centric um people started moving to eugene people were seeing each other at festivals and there was really a lot of community that way um and i think that that stuck and it grew out of eugene to places like you know bellingham and corvallis oregon bellingham washington you know now there's a real strong pres presence in colorado but i think that i think that pipe making community started in person and then grew to more mainstream. It was pretty mainstream though. Like I remember it was a trip. I was, you know, I'd, I was making pipes with Bob Snodgrass on a school bus in Oregon 
but my cousin in Indiana had heard of my name through pipe stuff, you know, and this was even before the internet. So I, I think, you know, to, you know, kind of brings back to my question of like, you know, how, you know, it's, it's kind of like the chicken or the egg a little bit. Okay. You know, social media is very tied up in these industries right now. Um, not which came first or after, but because it's so tied up, people spend a lot of attention on it. Does that mean that if there weren't social media, people wouldn't spend attention on it? I don't know. You know, and, and one of the questions I was going to ask, you know, Amy, um, do you think, you know, what do you think is the um, impact of social media marketing on the program at Urban Glass? Do you think that, you know, Urban Glass would be in a lot worse place without it? Do you think it's in a much better place with it? Or is it just kind of a thing? Those are my comments. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, David. Those are great. Welcome. Yeah, go ahead, Amy, if you want to answer that. So, you know, uh, David, I'm not, I'm not really sure because, um, oh, you're good. Am I on? Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not really, I'm not really sure because I think there's been a shift since the pandemic, uh, that I can't really speak to, but my experience is working in New York is that, um, less so social media and more so word of mouth was how is how um like my classes filled and how i you know all of my clients were word of mouth pretty much so it's like you work with one artist and then new york the new york art world is such a small community really that um you know it, it doesn't really take much and 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 like you know i get to know my students and i ask them like how did you find out about this most of them it was like oh my friend took your class and now i want to do it so i don't know and i don't have like a huge like social media presence um <clears throat> So, and I know like I always kind of use social media for like, if the class wasn't filling on its own, then you do a social media bump, but not really the other way around to the, to the best of my knowledge, you know, somebody from Urban Glass might say something different to that. But yeah, Rob just commented that he find me in the studio. So I think like in New York, I was just like, kind of like a, a studio creature who was there every day. And, you know, that's the spot where I worked. And so everyone knew where to find me. So it was very much an in-person thing in my experience. But I do think that, um, there, like I said, there has been a shift and I, and so I, I think maybe things have changed a little bit. I'm not sure, um, after the pandemic. So. Yeah, yeah. That's a cool question that kind of harkened back to something David also like pointed out earlier, which is like, how much do we, how much do institutions rely on social media, um, for marketing and, you know, all these other things, like, could we get by without it? So that's an interesting question. Uh, did you want to respond to that, Amy? Yeah. I just wanted to say like, I am teaching a workshop now, like this week, which is the first one in three years, like since all of the COVID stuff has happened since I've started really, um, like spending time with online communities in a, in a meaningful way. And I have noticed that like this, this group I'm working with now, yes, I'm at a different school. I'm not in New York. But these folks came from all over, you know, the country and also from Canada um, because we were connected on social media to take my class. And also the school I work at now does have a, a, a heavy social media presence as well. So it's interesting because it's, it's a different kind of student. Um, and so which kind of surprised me. So uh, I, I do think that social media does have an influence, but it depends on the on the school and what their social media like objectives are mm. um, for visibility. Awesome, Surfrat, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what David said. Uh, oh, by the way, my name is Brian Ratcliffe. Um, oh, great, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> good nice to meet you guys all. But yeah, David had a great point about Snodgrass and Eugene. And uh, if you listen to some of the interviews that he gave and just from where I was first uh, shown lamp working, it was definitely following festivals mainly. I mean, we all know Grateful Dead and then Fish. And uh, people were, there was a whole economy following these touring bands. And there was a lot of glass being sold in parking lots and at shows all around the, the United States, the world. And that was a huge uh, presence for flame working 
and color, especially, and fuming, and everything that was going on there. And then people were sharing and showing those to people around the world in the United States. So that was before social media that gave a big boost to the underground part of flame working that really, and then with social media, it definitely flourished from that. So. Awesome. It. Thanks for adding that. Um, I wanted to go to something Joe had said in the chat um, a little while ago about the topic. And he writes, weird reframing of the question, is it possible to be successful without relying on social media? I feel like I have to be using things like Instagram, but my enjoyment in using it has been steadily decreasing. I think that's a really interesting question because it's like, yeah, I totally get the like feeling like we have to use it. Like it's an obligation. And whenever I talk to anyone who like doesn't use it as much, they're like, Oh, I'm so bad about it. Oh, I have to get better. Like almost like the people I talk to like carry kind of like an internal guilt or like I'm not doing something. I should be doing something, even if it's not, not something I necessarily want to do. Um, and yeah, it is like, how do we define success? I'm sure there's ways we can define success. Like there's lots of ways you can define success without, um, like visibility on social media. Um, it is a big way. I think a lot of people now, especially like younger, like generation flame workers, it's like, oh, so-and-so has this many followers. They're that successful. When like, really there are so many like wonderfully amazing, um, you know, artists and people who like don't even have a social media presence at all. So um, I just wanted to put that out there to see like, you know, is it worth doing it? If you're not enjoying it, probably not. Um, and what are other ways we might define success? I mean, there's a lot of them, but it does feel like it doesn't have to be, um, I don't know, the two aren't always like exclusive of each other. And, you know, that kind of makes me think of this question of like, um, has anyone noticed any like negative things with social media that they wanted to talk about? Like, um, like for instance, for me, um, when I, if some videos blow up, like I experience a lot of like bullying, that's a big thing. Like just really mean, hateful comments that, um, I've gotten better at ignoring and kind of like brushing off. Um, but like, man, it's like so hard when people who don't even know you say like, <laughs> terrible things to you like that's definitely like a downside of visibility and of social media um it's not all like it's not all that great um and it is it can be a distraction um and I don't know if anyone's ever like experienced like like imposters like people pretending to be you online or anything like that um I was like I did my first giveaway and then like someone like made a fake website that was like pretending to be me and there and a fake Instagram pretending to be me. And they're like, you won my giveaway. And I had to tell all these people who were so excited that they won the giveaway that they hadn't. It was so funny. Um, Chris Mosley. Um, yeah, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the, the social media. Cause I mean, I do social media, but like Amy, you know, like I'm uh, don't have that big of a following and I'm not, you know, like I've, been able to navigate you know other means and believe it or not it's really interesting because i don't have a la address anymore and at least once a month i'll have someone from la just like who found me on google so um and for those who are um wherever you live it's 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 still probably doable but there was a moment where i really did like google ads then ads and um you know got your website i think there's like a, a certain number you have to hit where you can like commercialize monetize your website um, I, I, I'm no longer at those numbers, but there was a moment where I pushed for it and it boosted me up to the top of like glass blower in Los Angeles. Um, and, and, and I've gotten good views and, um, actually like some commissions from that. I think also with the social media, it does limit you. Um, I recently have landed in a place where there actually is a community, like physical, like nonprofits like art center, people doing murals, doing collabs, hanging out. And like, I realized I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Like, yeah, we share social media and whatnot. But like, you know, like most, a lot of people are like trying to get in the galleries or, you know, there's something we have called open studio, 
which is where you no, know, if you live in the county, um, you sign up, you can have an open studio, and there they the the county makes a map of like your studio, and then everyone local just runs walks around to all different types of people's studio, and they're like walking in your house, walking in your shipping container, things like that. So I think it's um one of those things where yeah, I feel like social media can limit you. Um, I I am someone who's like found alternatives. And for me, I guess maybe, you know, I'm almost 40 now having um, kind of like David going back to like that old school, um, finding, you know, I'm finding my like the clients of the the type of work that I'm making and want to make. I have to go to a certain demographic and all of them aren't on social media. So I have to like change how I market myself and the things that I do to go to them. And so that's been very versatile, um, you know, it's because they're not like, you know, like the dude down the street with the $5 million house is not on Instagram. So I'm like, how do I get my piece in his living room? You know, and it's gotten me thinking of like, okay, you know, like I need to do this or I need to have a show here. or I need to figure out like how to get my stuff um, displayed in downtown. Um, So I think there's, you know, like I think it, it kind of, you can use it as a tool, but also like, don't let like, you know, like there's still old school ways, you know, as a new school guy, there's still, I'm finding old school ways of doing things. And it seems like the, a lot of the older school ways is working for me because for you guys who know me, I'm like great in person. Social media does not freaking cover my personality even close. So I have to like, you know, like I gotta be in the streets. Um, and that still works for me. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you gotta like mix it up and like try a bunch of shit until you find that one jam that really works for you. Thanks, Chris. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you guys. Um, Jin Wanhan said in the chat, I wonder if anyone's experienced copyright issues, which is another kind of interesting question. Um, I know several like pipe makers have experienced or like I see them ex- actively experience like, um, oh, like a factory overseas stole design of one of my pipes. And they, that's like a real struggle with them. Um, and they get access to the design because it's on social media. Um, even one of my friends, I think it was like Andrew Serto was like, oh, like trying to copy one of my pipe designs. That means I've made it. <laughs> Um, yeah, if anyone else has experienced that, it's very interesting. Um, feel free to chime in and I'm just going to move along to the last question that I have, which kind of ties into that, which is, do you think virtual platforms have the potential to democratize flame working? So, you know, like during the pandemic, a lot of programming was free online and, you know, I'm wondering like what would be possible if like that inf- like information was always available to everyone. Um, I think nowadays with all the information online, like a lot of like co-learners get the chance to really sink their teeth into lots of resources. Um, and something that I was thinking about is that if you put your work out there online, it, it really um, encourages this idea of friendly competition um, you, if people see your work online, they're not going to be as afraid to, you know, respond to it. They may love it. They might hate it. Um, it makes you, I, I found it makes me have to talk about my work and defend it to more people. And in that sense, it's, it allows me to kind of flex that or work on that muscle of d- discussing and working an audience of vastly different types of demographics. Um, so it allows me to kind of, um, I don't know, conceptualize my work a little bit more through different perspectives. And it also does open you up to being copied. Um, People will see your work and maybe they'll take techniques. Maybe they'll get inspiration. Um, And I think personally, for the most part, like I'm very like pro that because it makes you sort of like double down on like, why is it important for me to do what I do? What does this mean for me? Um, And I have to do what I'm doing even better. Uh, so those are some ways I kind of think, you know, it, it's uh, it can be a good thing. Um, but if anyone else has any thoughts, do you think virtual platforms have the potential to democratize flame working? Amy. 
You know, um, I really enjoyed uh, getting together with this particular group. And there's something really special about having this, like what to me looks like a cross section, pretty good cross section of, um, of the flame working community, as far as in that, like we have a lot of different perspectives uh, represented. And I wonder uh, as far as like, where do we go from here? Um, like if there's more programming that we could build out to support each other using this space, like uh, maybe like a critique group or something or, or something where we can move beyond. Like, I think that, that this programming is uh, very satisfying, but like, I wonder if there could be additional programming where we could support each other in the work that we're making, for example, or, um, or something like that. Um, and I'd love to know if anyone else would be interested in something like that, or if you think it would work in virtual space, um, but potentially think based on the audience that's coming to these meetings, it would be really interesting to see who would show up for something like that, I think, and could could be a really good discussion. Awesome. I love that idea. And I think we're getting some uh, we're getting some interest in the chat. Very cool. For me as a flame worker, I just spent like 12 years like alone in my studio, not talking to anybody. So um, <laughs> now that we're in the age of Zoom and the age of connecting like this, this is like revolutionary for me personally. It's like often these are people I might see like once a year, if that. So I'm into it. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Um, it could be about the question. Oh, I see. Joe said something, I'm gonna read it. The field can only be democratized to the extent that the platforms are democratized. I think we need to think about democratizing the platforms and technology in order to further democratize the field. It's really, um, that's an interesting point. Um, I wonder what it would mean, how we could even democratize the platforms if we're not in control. Yeah, Amy. So, you know, I think that, you know, these bigger platforms, um, for sure, that's an issue. But like, what about something like Geeks, where, you know, we are making our own platform here, like, this is a startup that we made to, to function this way, you know, to facilitate this community interaction. And so, like, how do you all think that's going? Like, is that satisfying to you? Like, can we continue to build out this space, maybe? Um, because, you know, Ben's a web designer, we have Helen, we have Emily. Um, and like, I wonder what the limits are with geeks and, and could we add more functionality um, that would allow for, you know, more democrat democratization um, in flame working and more visibility, uh, but also more functionality for us too, um, as far as like maybe getting feedback from our work or whatever it is we need um, a virtual community to be, like, how can we build it out? Exactly. Tell us, tell us so we can build it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We want to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brian, go ahead. Uh, one spot that we maybe should look into would be Discord. Uh, it seems to be a little more unilateral platform that uh, it, there is one person that kind of pushes a lot of the notifications that you get, but I'm amazed at the amount of notifications that I get on my phone from Discord for the few amount of groups that I have, I'm a part of. And it is a good way to push a notification if you've posted something online or um, I don't know enough about it to give a full statement on it, but it might be somewhere to look to expand on that. Very cool. I have never used Discord and now after tonight, I'm kind of interested in checking it out. Um, it seems like an interesting platform. And I do think that like, it's it's a great point. Like we can't really, we don't have control over the big social media platforms, right? Like Facebook, like that's never gonna be in, on our, under our control, but something like Geeks, this is like a very safe space with lots of wonderful people. And I think this is maybe the act of democratizing right now. Um, if anyone else wants to add anything or has any feedback or thoughts, we would love to hear them. Um, you can type them in the chat. You can shout them out. There's no wrong answers. We really appreciate hearing from anyone. If you want to tell us later, also, you can just follow up, send us a message. Um, and 
I'm going to pass it back to Amy, who's going to wrap it up a little bit. And thanks, guys. This was so much fun. And I really appreciate all of you for tuning in. Thanks, Madeline. Um, I just wanted to circle back real quick in our final minutes here to our, our check-in earlier tonight and, um, and just ask again if you had any feedback about um, how we might proceed um, with this space um, and how specifically um, our meeting rate, um, does about four meetings a year seem okay to you all? Or do you think two? Okay, I see two or peace. That was peace. Okay. So <laughs> that was a piece. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this signal there. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Does four seem about right? Or do you think it, it could be more frequent or less frequent? Um, what, what do y'all think? Uh, we, we'd really like to have some feedback about that because that guy is how we proceed. Um, also, I'm wondering too if um, if you've made any use of the recordings or the meeting notes, um, because I think we have some stats on like how many people are accessing it. But I'm I'm curious to know like if it's people from this group who are like accessing the you know the notes to review, or if it's like a different audience um, who is just you know asynchronously joining us by accessing those. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any feedback on that, um, that would be that would be great. Oh, sorry, I think my video went out for a minute. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, perhaps we could start a more frequent space for making and sharing work. Okay, that would be great. I, I would be interested in personally in a critique group of some sort where we could start talking about each other's work. Um, I know I would really like that. Um, Janine says every other month, show and tell. That's an interesting idea. I like that. Okay. Yeah, it would, I think it, it might be nice to, you know, either in this space or as an addendum, like maybe additional programming, be nice to kind of put like a face with the work. And um, since, you know, the flame working community is kind of a small and intimate community, um, that's, that's one of the, the thoughts that I had. Um, and then, do you have any suggestions for continuing to grow this audience? Um, as far as like, you know, are there topics that you think uh, we could address more thoroughly or topics we haven't covered or anything else that we can use this space for that you'd like to see that we kind of haven't ventured into yet? Um, that would be great to know as well. And after the meeting's over, if, um, if you have thoughts that kind of bubble up later, please feel free to um, email the geeks the we can um, you can respond to the geeks chat or the is it the, the geeks chat right email um, I believe so or you can email me directly also that would work um, and I'll just pop my email in here um, whoops that's not my email oh nice to know okay so some folks are accessing the notes. Oops, can't spell my own name. Okay, so feel free to email me if you have any any further thoughts um, or want to talk privately after the meeting. I, I'd be happy to to hear anything and pass it on. Um, and also, yeah, we might send out an evaluation too. Um, yeah, and and Madeline put her email on there. So feel free to reach out to us. If we'd like to continue the conversation. Um, and I also wanted to add to you that I, I've accessed both the meeting notes and the recordings and especially the meeting notes. I found it, I pointed people towards the meeting notes um, because I found that the flame affinity group is, um, has been nice in real life as a conversation starter. Um, in, in particular, folks who are like maybe a little hesitant or like shy or maybe um, sat in on a meeting but didn't speak up and then approached me later on in real life and, and used that as like an icebreaker. Um, so it's, it's nice that it's reaching beyond this group. Um, and then also in my classes, I've referenced the meeting notes quite a few times and I love the, thanks so much for the formatting y'all did on that, making it really easy to navigate. Yeah. So I found that really, his really helpful as like a, um, like a document about, uh, that goes a little deeper into our community. 
you know, and kind of shows a different side of our community that isn't always represented. So I personally find the meeting notes and the recordings like really important documents um, that, that I personally reference a lot. All right, so um, this is our final meeting of this uh, of 2021-2022. Uh, so I'm going to sign off here and I just I want to thank you all so much for showing up um, and and contributing to the conversation. Super appreciate you all. And thanks so much to the Geek te Geeks team for um, all the back end and facilitating this whole platform. Um, we really appreciate you both. And thank you so much to my co-facilitator, Madeline Ryle Smith. Um, this has been such a pleasure. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you all in virtual space and maybe even in real life one of these days. So I hope you have a, all have a good night and thank you so much. Thank you all. You're so awesome. See you later. Hey, this is Emily from Geeks, AKA the Glass Education Exchange. Geeks is an online platform connecting people and sharing materials in the collective field of glass education. That's a bit of a mouthful. So what does it actually mean? Geeks creates supportive spaces outside of traditional academic structures to offer community building programming and resources. Programs like the Flame Affinity Group offer a space for constructive dialogue between practitioners in the field. We're hoping to nudge the field of glass into its next generation through new models of community support. This recording is also available through one of our initiatives, the Glass Resource Exchange. The Glass Resource Exchange is a user-contributed library collecting and sharing educational material like articles, supply lists, videos, and more. We're hoping to see it grow as a common resource supporting Glass teaching and learning. Want to support Geeks? Small donations really help us continue building our communal programming. Alternatively, you can subscribe to our lecture series featuring outstanding Glass artists and researchers. Learn more at geeks.glass slash support. Thanks for watching. Want updates on new Geeks programs and resources? Follow at Geeks Glass on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or visit our website, geeks.glass. Thanks again and stay tuned.